podcasts comes another football podcast. One man's quest to find the answers. Okay, boys. Let's go to work. Now, live from Pine Grove Studio B, it's Let Me Be Frank with T. Frank. Great news for Penn State football fans. I'm T. Frank. Today on Let Me Be Frank, we're talking about crowd noise because 107,000 people officially... Are you done? Okay, thank you. Today we're talking about how crowd noise affects the game of football because it absolutely does. There is not just anecdotal evidence, but home field advantage is a real thing in sports, especially in football. So how does 100 right now? Stop! I'm trying to talk. How does crowd noise affect the game of football? I have a feeling, and I want to take a look at some information, how it affects pressure. Under pressure. I think that this is a key area of the game where last year we saw tangible evidence that it affects defenses in an adversarial way to not have a home field crowd, and we saw the effects on pressure. Under pressure. Speaking of pressure, we're going to be talking about one key player, a critical must-get in the class of 2022 for Penn State, and they are feeling all kinds of pressure, or at least they should, about Drew Shelton, who can help affect pressure for the offense. Under pressure. Okay, let's begin. Not that. This is Let Me Be Frank. Maybe it's not the best way to start, uh, but I'm going to do it anyway. So the research I did on pressure, Under pressure was a little bit inconclusive on the college football level in 2020 because my theory was with no crowd noise and no home field advantage, defensive pressure on the quarterback would go down. And when I looked into it, actually, if you look at the information, the defensive pressure went up. And that was a little surprising. And when I did some research about, you know, looking at the film of what might cause stuff like that, I think the the regular um, reasons why are all still there when it comes to sometimes talent just wins out. And if you're a, an elite pass rusher, it doesn't matter what the situation is. You're going to win because the guy across from you is not going to play in the NFL, and you are. So the talent disparity in the NCAA is so much greater than it is at the next level. And we'll get to the NFL in just a little bit because I think that's where we can actually see a controlled situation. That's really the problem is when we're talking about college football, there is no real, like there's a rough even playing field, but it's a rough even playing field. 2020 made that worse because not only did it eliminate home field advantage, but teams were preparing differently. There were different rules across the country. Some places had fans. Some places had no fans. Some places were simulating crowd noise. Some decided they weren't going to do that. How teams practiced was completely different in 2020. Conferences just went all over the place when it came to how they were going to deal with everything that happened. And thus, I think it created a, a huge disparity and accentuated the ones that were already there. So that's a part of why I think defensive pressure went up in college football in 2020. The other thing is, um, in the NFL, there's more sophistication at the snap and pre-snap. In college football, like a lot of people start with a clap count now. So many clap counts. And some teams uh, will, they'll, they'll give the clap, then they'll wait and it's on the center to snap the ball. And some, it's just clap and go. So when it's a silent stadium, everyone's on the same plane. It's an even playing field. So there is no advantage for the offense. The offense is not choosing to take advantage 
of the situation to have an intricate snap count and and to catch catch the defense as off guard as possible. They were just doing things the same way that they always do because you're you're training college kids. It's not the same level of professional nuance and things like that. So the clap count in silent stadiums, home and away, defenses can tee off. So pressure went up in 2020 uh, for most teams. For most teams. For Penn State, it didn't. And I think we've gone into detail about that already. But in a controlled situation, when you when you are trying to deceive the defense as to when the football is being snapped, that is a huge advantage for the offense in the NFL. It's those microseconds. It's those split seconds that the offense has on the defense to get into pass rushing situations and to win. And I think that you can see a better picture of what I was expecting at the very least happen in the NFL because that is a situation where pressure did go down. Pressure went down in 2020, and it was, I think, best explained. And I'll give you two examples of places that have great crowd noise and the difference in 2019 and 2020. Because, again, remember, the, the, the offense knows what it's doing and the defense is reacting. So anytime the defense levels the playing field, you see a different personality come out in, in defenders and in schemes and in defensive coordinators. Seattle has great home field advantage. Notoriously, they have uh, their stadium is designed to keep in sound. Watch how, I know it's the Bengals, watch how the right guard has to give the visual cue to the center to snap the football on this play. play but it was saved by Clowney. Seventh play of the drive, Dalton from the gun on third and ten. He had to double clutch it. Now, if you're a smart defender, you're going to watch that head bob, and then the third time you see it, you're timing the snap count from the center. That is an, that's, that's easy stuff. That's NFL 101 in film watching. 2019, you could see there the Seahawks had the advantage on that third and long, and the Bengals knew it. They were, they were running a screen play. On third and long, they were just trying to get the defense to be over-aggressive and to get catch them upfield. It obviously didn't work because it was the Bengals, and also the defense was just prepared. They're, they're, they have the advantage in that situation. Now watch the drastic difference just a year later, no fans in Seattle against the Arizona Cardinals. Similar situation, it's third and long. Everything from the play call onward is completely different. Now what Kenny Norton decides to do on third down. Third down and seven. Murray throw. Just four rushers. They're, they're throwing a, a deep ball to the sideline to throw past the sticks for first down. No pressure on Kyler Murray. And he uses like a regular snap count. The, there's no pressure, Under pressure on that play. And I think that's that was more of what I was expecting to happen across football in 2020. So for your favorite NFL team, if their defense didn't perform well last year, I do think that this is going to be something that returns to norm and offenses are not going to be as explosive in 2021 as they were in 2020 because th there was no advantage for the defense. Th there's no advantage to begin with. They're always uh, on their heels against offenses, but when even at home, they don't have that slight advantage of even just having an even playing field. If everyone sees the snap happen at the same time, then you're going to have offenses just skyrocket. There were more points scored in the NFL last year in the first couple of weeks. In, I think it was the first four weeks than in NFL history in that first four that first month period. And holding calls were way down as well. So the op, the NFL clearly, if we don't have crowd noise and ambiance to translate on TV, we are going to lean into as many points as possible. So that worked out for them. At the college football level. I think we'll see a return to what we saw before, which is less pressure on quarterbacks unless it's in those big situations, those third and longs, because I still believe that that still applies in college football, that offenses are at a disadvantage on the snap of the football in away stadiums. So your noise when you go to Beaver Stadium is incredibly important. So just remember when you can't sing in church on Sunday and you go to uh, work on Monday and you sound like you're in a mafia movie because they're talking like this. <laughs> you lost your voice and you actually made a tangible difference on the football field. It was worth it. This is Let Me Be Frank.
So let's look at the other side of pressure. Under pressure. And by the way, I'm not getting tired of that, so you're going to have to live with it. Um, this is the actual metaphysical pressure, not the pressure applied by the defense on the offense on the football field, although that does come into play here. So when we're talking about the pressure that Penn State is under right now, it's immense. This is one of the craziest recruiting months probably in recorded history of things that are above the board, right? Like we're not talking SMU in the 80s sort of crazy recruiting. We're talking about the legal recruiting that is being done right now across the country because a dead period of in-person recruiting that lasted more than a year ended June 1st. The floodgates are open. Players are going to their favorite schools. They're going to go see and, and make decisions on their future over the next month and a half. So... The guys that Penn State is targeting, there are a lot of them that are important. And you will not get an argument from me about Nick Singleton or about Deny Dennis Sutton, who is going to be a superstar recruit in the class of 2022, according to people I've talked to. And uh, obviously, quarterbacks trump everything. So getting the right one and getting one that you are comfortable with and you think is the future, all of those are more important. But if there is a guy that I don't think you can miss on, and I don't mean that he's that good, but you just cannot miss on Drew Shelton if you're Penn State. And it, it's, it's much to do with his talent as it is who's on the roster. Because I think, I think Drew Shelton is the heir apparent to Rasheed Walker at the left tackle position in every sense of the word. I think he's super athletic and another guy that I'm going to be unnaturally high on because I don't see any physical impediments. I think he can do everything. And it just comes down to then training from the coaching staff and, and taking that training and the mental aspect of that. He is a little bit raw as a prospect. So this is not a guy that is going to come in and challenge for playing time right away. I don't think this is not a situation. Like I think Landon Tangwall with the right set of circumstances could see playing time in 2021. I don't think Drew Shelton is coming in and playing in 22. Cause I think he still needs some work on his technique, but it is so much better than it was as a sophomore. He has actual pass sets. Now I'm very encouraged by the progress his, his game has taken over the course of the time that we've been aware of Drew Shelton. And he is, the, he's a left tackle to, for sure to me. He's the athletic profile of what you're looking for. But again, he's in 22. He's not going to be on campus. He's going to IMG Academy for his senior year. So that is a big thing. And he will get training there. And I think you can see an acceleration in his uh, progression because of that. But this is where last year comes back to bite Penn State. Because, and I, I'm sorry, Penn State fans, for bringing this up, but Penn State missed on Nolan Rucci in 2021. And not only did you miss out on a five-star transcendent type of talent, a guy that you just look at and you know is the answer. That's that's how when I look, I looked at about four snaps of Nolan Rucci, and that's all I needed to see. He goes to Wisconsin. Not only did you miss on him, but it was really late in the process, and they weren't able to replace him as a tackle in the draft class, in, in the recruiting class. So not only that, then they were in on a bunch of guys, and they just missed on all of their tackle prospects last year. So this puts you in a really tough situation if you're Penn State because... There's nobody on the roster right now to me that's the heir apparent to Rasheed Walker. Again, Drew Shelton, you can't miss on him because at that point, you are now going years without a quality left tackle prospect in one of your recruiting classes. The last one was Walker in 2019. So you might be in a situation, and, and I don't think it'll come to this, but you could be in a situation where a guy like Landon Tengwall, who I think is going to be a really good guard, might have to play tackle if they don't solve this problem in one way or another. He played tackle in high school, and I think he profiles way better as a guard, but Ryan Bates had to do it, and I know it's a different it's a different era in Penn State football under James Franklin than it was then, but these situations do come up, and this is how they happen. Uh, the only other player on the roster that really fits the profile that I think has been recruited recently would be Olaf Ashunu, but sources that I've talked to say it's been up and down as far as his his uh, production and performance and practice. So his progression is not going in the way that you would expect for a guy to be taking over for Rasheed Walker in 2022. Now, it's it's a long way off, and lots of things can change including, and this is a really important one, the transfer portal. Now you're thinking with portals. Because not only can the transfer portal take from you, 
it can give you players. And I think that that's becoming more evident as Penn State is getting in on more players in the transfer portal. Now you're thinking with portals. So if you don't have a tackle on your roster and there is turnover at a program, you, may, you might get a situation where another guy like Johnny Dixon falls in your lap and you get a quality prospect with lots of years and lots of development left and lots of ceiling. You might even be able to find a senior transfer like Derek Tangelo or Arnold Ebikidi. Penn State is more active there to solve more problems that way so they don't have to go just to the JUCO route. But make no mistake about it. The left tackle position at Penn State right now does not have a clear future. There's one guy, though, for 2021 to be the backup to Rasheed Walker that Penn State has uh, been high on. And James Franklin stopped a press conference to talk about him. That, I, I'd, also, I'd also like to mention uh, Bryce Effner uh, has really had a nice spring. I, you know, I would describe him as the, the light has really come on for him. He creates position flexibility at tackle, uh, guard, and center. Probably tackle and center as much as anything. Uh, we had a guy uh, you know, you know, twist an ankle the other day in practice, and Bryce had to go in at center and, and did, a, did a damn good job. So uh, you know, he's a guy that we always felt like had the body we were looking for and the athleticism we were looking for, but just was still putting it all together. And uh, he's in a great place right now. There's a lot of people talking about Bryce and excited about, you know, his future. Now, it's all changing because not only are we not using sophomore, junior, senior, or anything like that, uh, but also everyone has an extra year of eligibility. But the problem does still remain that Bryce Effner, even though the light has come on for him, as James Franklin has said, and he did look good in the spring. He was recruited in the class of 2018. He's a, he's listed as a redshirt junior on the roster, which means he was a redshirt junior last year. He's going to have a bonus year of eligibility, but that's your stopgap measure is Bryce Effner in 2022 to back up Rasheed Walker and be the swing tackle right now with center versatility, everything James Franklin just said. But you don't have a long-term answer on the roster. Bryce Effner is the guy that's been singled out and has been the, whoo, we found a guy. Thank goodness. And I'm not trying to take anything away from Bryce Effner, but he is older and he is a guy that is not on the roster forever. So Penn State, they are under pressure, under pressure. to get Drew Shelton. 